That's per that's incredible actually. Yeah, so I, I So this is Tower Bridge in London. Yeah. I think and it doesn't go up very often now, does it? It goes up more often than you think, probably on average a couple of times a day. Really? I would think that, that frequently yeah. still. Yeah. Right? Well I guess it has to, yeah. I guess what I'm gonna do I, I can't park here because these are red lines, red lines are as you know, we can't cross red lines. Mm -hmm. But I can drop you here. Okay. And I'm gonna go over the bridge and come back here and I'm gonna be parked left at the lights down here. Okay. All right, everybody. So we're at Tower Bridge in London. So we're going to go check out the Tower Bridge engine room, which is uh, what lifts the bridge up and down, right? The, uh, the bridge actually moves. Like it's, it's not a drawbridge, it's a fast through bridge. So the two sides of the bridge come up, draw up like a drawbridge. So. It's electric now, but we're gonna go look at the steam museum. Alrighty, so I got my tickets, but apparently the lady was saying you gotta get the full ticket to see the top of the bridge, like the whole bridge itself. So we're gonna walk across the bridge and go buy tickets to the north side. So we're walking across the bridge now. William Armstrong, he was a solicitor, otherwise known as a lawyer, they call them solicitors over here. He uh, went on a fishing trip one day and saw that water wheels were inefficient, decided he was going to change things. So he began to design hydraulic accumulators, which basically steam pumps pump water into these big tanks that store the pressurized water, um, some stored energy, and then when they need to lift the bascules, they could basically release the hydraulic accumulators in this pressurized water would go into a piston, which enabled the cogs, the gears, the cog gears, um, on the drive motor to function. But it was functioning purely off hydraulics. So, off to the engine rooms we go. So we are in the engine rooms now, where all the magic happens, the steams, the boilers, the coal, the hot, dusty, horrible environment. So let's go. So this is the actual boiler. See the water coming into the bottom and the steam coming out the top. So this is where this would have happened. These boilers made steam which powered the engine rooms coal was burned to boil water. You can see that's what it would look like. It's just a boiler. So we got the coal boiler. It boils the water into steam. Then we've got the steam pump engines, which obviously pump water into the hydraulic pumps. So rotative beam engine. You can see that's because it's a rotative, uh, not a walking beam, rotative beam engine. You've got the governor there, pressure relief valves, and then attached to hydraulic pumps. And then these hydraulic pumps work 
which then is collected in these accumulators. And then when they want to drive the actual engines, they release the, these accumulators store water, pressurized water. They'll drop down, pushing all this pressurized water over to the drive piston, which then works the cog that opens the bridge. This rotative beam engine is running off steam, right? Water's coming into the boiler, which is running the hydraulic pump, which is pumping water into the accumulators. And as the rise, see, the accumulators rise, that's all stored energy coming from the hydraulic pump. Now the accumulators are coming down and they're gonna run the cog or the cog system, right? You can see the cranks working. Rotative beam engine. Two, 20 tons of coal a week. So you see the rotative beam engine at work here. See the governor spinning? That's what controls the RPM, that governor there. It's the centrifugal governor. It's working. See the governor? See how the governor speeds up again and then the uh, rotated beam engine keeps working? So that's the crank assembly. So there's a walking beam which pivots on a central point. You have to pump on one side and the actuate the steam piston actuator on the other side. But this is rotative beam, so it works in a circle as opposed to a like horizontal uh, walking beam. Just gorgeous. This is gorgeous, perfectly restored. This is the piston. High pressure cylinder. They actually have this working. I can't believe it. There you go, see? And the whole thing is working off. It's rotating around a circle. You can see the governor spinning. Watch, it's gonna speed up while slowing down. And now it's gonna get fast again. Oh God, this is not no, so nice, man. See, so the flywheel, this is the flywheel, right? Flywheel, which is attached to the crank, which is powered by the piston, right? See the oil reservoir, oh, one's getting a little low. Piston guides, high pressure cylinder. So this is where the governor is, is moderating the RPM to keep it at a good thing, pressure release. These are the pumps. This is what's pumping the water into the hydraulic pump, which then sends it to the accumulators, which is just stored energy for to lift the bascules when they need to. But it's all just working off pumping water, basically. Stationary two engines, 360 HP each. You can see you can see how the governor is mediate is mediating the uh, the flow of steam coming in, right? And then it just recondenses and gets sent back to the boiler. It's called the Rankin cycle. The Rankin cycle of thermodynamics. We're going to go look at the hydraulic pumps next, but you can see it works. The steam pump works in conjunction with the hydraulic pump because it's got to pump water, basically. So you're using this piston assembly to pump water from the hydraulic pump. Four drive engines up to 140 HP each. See how simple it is though? This is where all the magic happens. So this cog, well series of cogs, moved the bascules up and down and you can see actually, it's been moved, right? This obviously wasn't here. At one point in time, yeah guys, this would have been one of the cogs in the system. Like I said, you have that hydraulic pump, which pumps the water to the accumulators, right? You've got the shivs, cables, what's that cable doing? Oh, it's weight there, which moves the piston, which then pumps fluid, steam, which then pumps all the water. You can see, so it's this counterweight here, steam line, piston, which then moves everything which then pumps all the water into the accumulator. See all the, the piping, the bolts, the flanges, elbows, all driving right there at the counterweighted set of shivs there with that piston. You see where the steam comes in and it moves all of this. That's how it, all of it moves. You get the hydraulic pump there, right? So steam pump powers the 
hydraulic pumps, which power the accumulators, which drive the bridge. Fundamentally, right? That's what's going on here. Hydraulics, one of the early, early hydraulic setups in the world. So this is it, guys. This is the accumulators. This is where that hydraulic pump we just saw would pump all this water into here, because that, it's that secondary action from that steam bolt, for primary action actually from that piston, or just the way the cranks are connected. But basically, the boiler we saw runs the steam pump, which then pumps water into the hydraulic pump, which then is double acts as it's both pumping water in and then pushing it out into the accumulators. And then the accumulators are in charge of storing the energy until they need to use it to lift the bridge up. It's a very ingenious system. Sir William Armstrong, a solicitor with a passion for engineering, and he became one of the biggest engineers of the industrial age of the 1850s. Newcastle of Tyne, uh, the docks there, he used his um, hydraulic systems there as well in the 18, 1854. See, so he has a double acting pump too, hydraulic pump. We looked at that in the Kingston Pump House. Double acting pump. Intake and exhaust as well. High pressure water control valves, very important. Needle valves. These are all needle, most of these are all needle valves. Absolutely gorgeous. There was a competition for designing it. Absolutely beautiful architecture. On the Thames. Alrighty guys, so Tower Bridge. It took eight years and cost 1,184,000 pounds to build the tower. In 1890, the foundations for the Tower Bridge were completed. They reached eight meters deep below the Thames. Teams of divers and navvies worked over two years to create the footings. So we had divers down there, right? The key for putting the wing nuts on. C.B. Gorman. Underwater land. Divers underwater land. See, he's got a lead weight there, right? On the front on his chest. Lead boots too to weigh down his feet. You can see the the wing nuts. So the flange, this right here, oh it's this real cast too. That's cast properly, you can see that. See those wing nuts? 39 kilos of weights too. That's crazy. A lot of weight. Okay, how to build a case on Tower Bridge. Teams of four divers worked in nine hour shifts submerged in the Thames. They dug out nearly six meters of Thames riverbed gravel and clay to sink huge metal caissons deep under the riverbed. That would not be fun, man. Holy, it's a nasty dive, that one. So you can see, right, Buddy here, working his way down. Buddy on the bottom, he's got a shovel and he's giving, just giving it, right? And then the, gradually as the caissons sink down, the weight of the caissons sink down and go deeper, right? You can see the riverbeds here, with about six meters of penetration, pumping water from the caissons each day, enabled the divers and later navvies to dig further down, up to one meter per shift, to bring them over the high water. The total height of the caissons had to be over 17 meters. The segments, you see they're pumping water out there, dewatering, and then they got their little sophisticated excavation system, pick, shovel, and a bucket. Very similar to the mining, right? They've got a block and tackle there. He goes up to Buddy there and he moves it away. Progression right now, he's going out sideways. Eight meters, so eight meters of total penetration in the riverbed. And 10 meters of high tide, because the Thames is tidal. Same thing though, right? Pumping water out, excavating. You can see the cobbles, cobbles and gravels. For drainage, using that for drainage. See Buddy there. God, this would be brutal work, guys. But once it was dewatered and the caisson had sunk deep enough into the ground on its own weight, that's when the knobbies would come in. Because you can see here, this guy, he's diving. He's got all his equipment on. 10 pounds per minute, too, not bad. 
but it's not fully down yet, right? It's only six meters. And then when the Navi's down, you can see the, the tip of the pile is in the cobbles, kind of sealing off, and they're always pumping water or right dewatering. So the final stage before filling in concrete was the brave team, was brave teams of Navi's to go down and dig further and then sideways. This was to join the caissons to create a safe, stable footprint for the towers. The wider something is at its base, the more stable it is. Tri called Triangle of Stability. Head Wright and Sons Company, 1886 to 24 huge steel cages. The caissons were lowered into the riverbed. Square triangular caissons formed individual chambers. In these, teams of divers worked to dig out the foundations for the two towers. As the works progressed, the weight of the caissons pushed them deeper into the clay. He's got his lifeline tied around him there, got a bowling. Yeah, that's a bowling, yeah, got a bowling on there. And then we've got the air holes going out of the back of the helmet, right? And canvas suit. Fifty designs were submitted, that's what me and David were talking about with the architect competitions. It was the winning design of the best school or seesaw bridge, which opened in the middle. Not everyone liked it. Queen Victoria thought it would ruin the view of the Tower of London. So the very modern bridge was covered in stone to look old. John Mulberry was an engineer who specialized in metal railway bridges. He joined the team and changed the metal arch into a horizontal span. It is now possible to build horizontal roofs, on which you are now standing. Building work started in 1886, and John Barry took over when Sir Horace Jones died one year into the works. Rivets. You can hear that wind too. That's wind, by the way, if you guys aren't sure what that rumbling noise is. All right, so we went up the North Tower. We're gonna come down the South now. And we crossed over. We did the loop on the walkways, the horizontal walkways. Steam engines were replaced by electrical engines and oil hydraulics in 1976. The roof consists of 48 tons of slate and 55,000 copper nails. The gate man. In post, he drew the rope across the road to stop traffic during bridge lifts. There were, on average, 9,000 lifts per year. Okay, so we finished the towers, so we were just up there. So the Rotherhithe Tunnel is what it's called? Yeah, Rotherhithe is, is a, an, an area of South London. So it's called the Rotherhithe Tunnel. And it, 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 I think, I don't know its history, but I would guess that it was built to link the docks because it's very much in the heart of Docklands. The, at that time, the docks would have been absolutely at their prime. Mm, yeah, oh, for sure. Everything coming in. Yeah, yeah, on the Thames, yeah. The Thames. So, um, so my guess is pretty much sure that that's what what, what would have happened. Normally, because this is uh, New Year's week, uh, this road's quite clear, but normally in, in the 
week this, at this time, which is kind of Russian, this road would just be jammed and you'd be bumped as well.